Okay, we're here with Nathan Jurgensen today, and uh, Nathan is a is a really awesome guy. He's super fast. If anyone's ever run with him, you already know that. Uh, he's a member of Beast Racing, my teammate. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it live. <laughs> and uh, right now he's making his run in Road to Pro, but um, you might know him from some other places because he's just all over the place. Obviously, he's in Beast Racing. You'll catch him on podium every now and again doing that or maybe some other broadcast racing for Beast. Uh, he's very active in the A51 community. That's how the A51 guys know him. He's also very active with Mr. John Theodore, uh, a friend of the stream, and he's just all over the place. Nathan, why don't you tell everyone, hey? Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me? Oh, you sound great. You got him, chat? Hey, Rachel, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? All right. So, Nathan here, as I mentioned before, he is uh, he's a member of Beast Racing, and uh, Nathan, how long have you been racing for? Uh, on iRacing, I started late 27, so like winter 2017. Man, so not long at all, actually. So only about, geez, so only about six months longer than me, Nathan. Yeah, I started uh, in the winter and kind of just did a bunch of carb cups and rookies and stuff like that. And then uh, kind of over the winter, started driving the other cars. And then last year, you know, in February, I did a run at NIS and kind of did the whole NIS season, learning the A car. Uh, so yeah, that's been my time and I'm in year number two. Oh yeah. So I know in a short amount of time, Nathan, you're already very well known on the sim, uh, not only for being fast, but just being a good dude. And uh, that's something I definitely appreciate about you, Nathan. And, uh, Nathan, you reside in California, correct? I'm out here in sunny LA. Oh, that must be nice. I'm here in freezing cold Michigan. It snowed last night in May. Well, I'm a Midwest guy. I did in April. Uh... I did many, many winters, so I've done my time. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I hope everyone's having a good night tonight. Uh, we got a lot in store for you. Nathan is just, he's got a wealth of knowledge in iRacing already. He just, uh, he got into it, and he absorbed all that stuff, and he applied it, and he got really fast, really quick. So we're going to, we'll just hop right in here. Um, before we get into about your, your, really your history, Nathan, one thing I'd love to talk to you about is some uh, iRacing, and then let's get some NASCAR news as well. And uh, we're about three weeks now into the new package in iRacing for the A car. And I know before this package, you were blazing fast. You had that car down. You could drive it off the right rear like nobody else's and uh, business. And you were just fast. So how do you feel about this new package? And obviously, it wasn't iRacing's choice for this package. It was NASCAR's. They were just trying to emulate it. What do you think about it so far? Um, well, for, for iRacing, I think the package works better. Yeah, I don't like the philosophy of it. Uh, it's not as much fun to drive, um, but for watching streams, it's a blast. Oh, yeah. uh, it, it does work pretty well in iRacing. Um, in real life, uh, not so much. Uh, it's, you know, the racing isn't any better, uh, and then, then it's just slower. You know, I went to the Auto Club uh, race, and, you know, I've been there the last two years, mm. and it looked the same. Um, visually, it was pretty boring both times, and uh, then now uh, this year, uh, the cars were going slower, so that's less fun. And, and one thing I didn't know until I went to the race was they're quieter. One of my favorite things about going to races is how loud those cars are. Where they, you know, they almost hit you in the chest. They're so loud, and uh, the cars were quieter Man. this year, going slower. Um, so that was kind of a bummer. So I, I don't think it's worked out uh, super well. And yeah, non i racing, you know, I like I like a hard to drive car, but at the same time, you know, I, it one of the things that bums me out is we spend more time talking about packages than the racing. And at the end of the day, yeah. uh, I want to be up against, you know, the best drivers still run at the front yep. and you know, all the best people all get inside of a car and try to go around in the circle faster. Oh, than hold the on, Nate. Hold on. Keep going. Keep talking about this. Package. Sounds like your uh, house is on fire. I think that might be a fire alarm going off. All right, so I'm here all by myself. Uh, I host the show now. Welcome to It's Me, Nathan. Our guest is uh, Fastlane Rachel. Rachel, what do you got to say? <laughs> the show is all mine. We're here to talk about politics. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Sorry about that. My wife is cooking and she set off the fire alarms. I was like, you got to be. Hey, listen, anything can happen on the podcast and so we wouldn't fix that so we were talking about this package though and you did say something it does seem like we're talking more about package 
than we are about even excellent racing um, in NASCAR. I don't think it's true in uh, I racing though. So when we watch like you know like the Peak Series in the new package, holy cow, it's like a restrictor plate race every week <laughs> watching those guys, which is really cool. Yeah, whatever. I mean, yeah, I mean it's a, it's all the best people all trying to beat each other. Um, given uh, the same set of rules and constrictions and all that, and like whatever, at the end of the, you know, the packages will change, they'll come and go. The next one might be harder to drive, then the one after that might be you know not hard to drive. But I'm kind of I'm kind of over just constant like everyone's a pundit and you're just analyzing it nonstop. Yeah. I felt I, I love that Kyle Busch interview where you know I think it was Jeff Gluck or somebody was asking him you know what's the racing going to be like? What's the racing going to be like? And he finally was just like shut up, like just watch the race. We're all going to race each other. <laughs> Like, let's just, it's racing. And, you know, I think if there's anything, the problem is, is that the racing isn't more fun than package analysis. And yeah. both of us, right now, they're both pretty boring. And that's, that's a bummer. Yeah, it's pretty sad. So have you driven a, a lot of the new A car yet? I know you're focusing on Road to Pro right now, so you're in the truck quite a bit. But have you driven around in the A car in the new package yet? Yeah, a little bit. It's not really that interesting to me. I'll probably run more uh, the truck and the B car um, and the, mm-hmm. even the D car. I love the national car. Um, but I'll run the A car and short tracks and road courses, and uh, that's pretty fun. Uh, mile and a half stuff isn't that interesting to me. Um, honestly, in the old package, the mile and a half stuff, like, you know, the Atlanta, Charlotte, Texas, Vegas, Kentucky, Michigan, Auto Club, like oh, yeah. all of those tracks, I find them all, honestly, pretty boring. Uh, to watch and a race and uh, you know I, I got pretty good at them last year because I was doing NIS and hey you know we're three four years down the line if I can get better and make it to peak or whatever uh, yeah I'll get back into the A car but for now it's uh, yeah. you know it's fun to watch but I don't have that much of interest uh, in driving it I think that's that, that's the biggest thing that bums me out about this new package because um, your your home track I guess Auto Club and my home track of MIS Michigan International Speedway it's just the first 10 laps for full throttle down hard on that gas and just it's kind of boring racing you know and i was so I was good at michigan in the a car but... before oh now that's gone yeah i mean honestly I, I find those tracks pretty boring you know last year i found them boring too and i guess you're white knuckling it a little bit more mm-hmm. uh worried about losing the car and exit and now you're white knuckling it because you're worried about the draft um i think that's just a trade-off to me i don't see one as worse or better to me, they're both kind of boring on those big tracks. I like short tracks, uh, personally, and flat tracks, uh, and those are the most fun to me. And uh, and luckily, they're still pretty good in the A-car with the full horsepower. Oh, Nathan, we got some good questions already to ask you at the end. Guys, hang on to those questions, and then re-ask them again at the end, because there's already two really good questions for Nathan. But we're going to move on to the next item here. And uh, Nate, how did you get into iRacing? What, what brought you in, and what's kept you, really? Yeah, it's kind of weird. I mean, I'm not a. I don't have any background driving race cars uh, or running previous uh, sims. Uh, and actually, I don't. I don't really play video games. <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, it's a. It's a. I, I just really like racing. And uh, um, you know, when I was a little kid, I did play the Indianapolis 500 simulator. It was kind of the first simulator, <laughs> and it came on a five and a half inch floppy disk. Uh, and uh, and I you'd I run it with the four direction buttons. And I did that for hours, you know, when I was like seven, eight years old. Uh, and actually, I only found out recently that the person who made that is the same person who, you know, did Papyrus did and is doing iRacing. I didn't even realize that was in the same the same person. But uh, uh, but then I yeah, I didn't do it, didn't do anything. You know, I just have like a job and a life, and just never get you know got into uh, any kind of a video game. But I always, if mm-hmm. I am going to play a video game, I want always want to do a driving one. And then uh, in 2017, in the summer, uh, I just kind of got an itch. I saw the the Oculus went down on its price and it got really cheap. And I was like, man, I really want to try out this Rift. And uh, I, sometimes I'd watch people do iRacing on YouTube, uh, watching streamers like Jeff Faviano mm-hmm. and, uh, and Aaron Rodgers. Uh, so I was watching them and I was just like, man, this looks like so much fun. And, you know, now I have like a job and a little bit of disposable income. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, go and just do it. And I just had this weird feeling in my head that I'd be good at it. Um, you know, like, you think you're going to be good at things and then you try them out and you realize that you're not going to be good at it. But, uh, it, you know, for whatever reason, I just kind of had a knack, uh, for it. So that was, uh, you know, pretty quickly got up to, I, my goal was to be able to be good enough to run with Aaron and then John Theodore. So I was watching their streams and it looked like so much fun. And I thought, man, if I really work at this, maybe I could be good enough to, you know, be run behind them. <laughs> uh, and that was kind of my goal. And uh, that's, that's how I got into watching Aaron's videos. I was just trying and I worked really hard, um, 
wanting to be as quick as him. That was really my goal. And, uh, and w one of the things I really love about Aaron Stream, particularly, is how good he is at describing what he's doing. Uh, so it's a really, um, it's a good learning tool. And uh, so that's, that's what I was doing. I learned how to drive this, uh, drive the sim watching Aaron. Uh, so just, I, I just can't be more appreciative of uh, him, uh, yes. his stream. That was kind of before his community. Uh, and then obviously the A51 community uh, and you, I really love your attitude when it comes to racing and treating other people right. And then obviously John Theodore uh, as well, the way he kind of talks through the, you know, John doesn't really talk through how he's driving the cars that I, uh, that I learned from as much as racecraft. John was really good at describing yes. racecraft uh, and really learning fuel mileage and like, how do you actually bring that car home? So I really learned you know, a lot of driving skills from Aaron and a lot of race strategies, uh, skills from John. And, uh, that's, that's what I applied kind of over this last year, learning how to drive. I never thought about that, but that really is true. Isn't it? Aaron will teach you how to drive the car and John will teach you what type of person you should be while you're behind the wheel, which is also uh, racecraft. John's racecraft is really, yeah. really. Good. Yeah. That's amazing. That is true about those two. See, that's one thing too. I hope, um, I racing understands how important the, and I'm not talking about myself. I'm 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 not that influential yet. How important the bigger Twitch streamers are, or just the racing streamers, period, are to the iRacing community. I mean, Aaron's created this huge community. John's got a huge community now. Um, I mean, they're just bringing people into the sim like crazy. Like you, me, Lou said he was watching True Racer. That's what got him into it. Um, so far, everyone that's been on here is brought in by a streamer, which is pretty amazing it's if you think about it. There's something more engaging about it than sometimes a real NASCAR broadcast, you know, and watching someone do an NIA. I really love the long races mm -hmm. with a lot of strategy, a lot of race craft. Uh, I think that's, and watching that driver go through it lap after lap and all the close calls, I find it, you know, some, uh, most of the time more interesting than watching a cup race on TV. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris says, Aaron got me. Yo says, don't I, <laughs> when you were talking about uh, trying to be faster than, um, Theodore and, and Aaron, he says, and crappy. <laughs> I'll never be faster than crappy. That is a fact. Oh, that Scott Yost. Fan favorite, by the way. We got to get you on here, Yost. So, so I'm sorry, Randy. I, I, you know, I hate to say it on this stream, but I think uh, 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 crappy's got the best stream on the, in, in the game. Oh, yeah. I'm not disagreeing. I'm always pushing people to his stream because he's just... And the funny thing is, it's just him and his car. But he's such a personality; it's awesome. <laughs> you know? The stream of consciousness is uh, is well worth the price of admission. Yeah, yep. So I, I I'm not in disagreement at all. I think it, Yost does have the best stream in all of iRacing, which is saying a lot because there's a lot of good streams out there. So Nate, when you first got into iRacing, were you naturally talented and just fast, or um, did you do something else to get faster? I mean, I think that is a good distinction. There's like people who are like natural skill. They just jump in and they're like the quickest and they don't even yeah. have to think about it. And they're probably yeah. even faster when they don't think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's people who learn, like they, they fought their way into it. And I'm, I feel like I'm definitely on the learn side. Like I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm someone who thinks about it and analyzes it. And I, I, I don't want anyone to outsmart me. I'm going to, I'm going to, to me, racing is like a puzzle to figure out. And I, that's, I want to be the best at that. Uh, and then I know that there's other guys that just jump in and they have way more natural talent and skill than I'll yep. ever have. Uh, so I have to kind of, I have to outthink them because they could probably outdrive me. Yeah. I I'm kind of the same way too, Nate. You can see on my streams when I get lots of practice, I can run up front in the top split. I get like 20 minutes of practice. <laughs> I'll be running in the back. <laughs> so I'm definitely one of those. I have to learn and think about it and do all those things. And then you got guys like Lou who just hops in the A car for the first time in an official race. And takes home a win. What a punk. <laughs> That's awesome. Lou's awesome. Yes, he's very much awesome. Speaking of Lou, um, let's talk about Beast Racing. How how did you get involved in Beast Racing? And uh, what's the story um, and how you got involved with that? Yeah, it seemed like uh, making a run at Road Pro was the next thing I needed to do. Um, I did, you know, ran the D series uh, over the winter uh, you know, a year ago, and then last year I did NIS and uh, actually got the Division Two championship in NIS uh, fixed, and uh, which was oh, kind you of won that? Long. See, I didn't even know you won that. That's a big yeah, deal. Division Two, you know, Division Two, but there's a lot of a lot of good guys that you know started the year like me at like a three thousand uh, who were running fourth, fifth split, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, a few of us kind of made it up into like the 5K I rating. We're running top split at the end of the year. And so I, I kind of treat that D2 championship as like rookie of the year, you know. Uh, yeah. and, okay. Uh, and so it kind of seemed like the next thing I needed to do was make a run at Road to Pro. Um, and uh, that's an open setup deal. And you need teams. You know, you're it's a you know, really moving up uh, to a dip, kind of a different thing. So I spent this last off season, you know, really trying to learn as uh, much as I could about open setups. Uh, and uh, and then Lou started uh, the road to pro side of uh, Beast Racing. So Beast uh, definitely has a big presence in the road side. And uh, so Lou put together a team uh, to run road to pro on the oval side. And uh, so uh, I think I was tapped for that because he kind of saw my race craft and my, you know, I was good in the big car. Uh, lose uh, communities much a lot of the short track guys like you know doing late models and legends and stuff like that and so he got chris carroll and parker brookfield uh mason bailey uh and we kind of got together and uh uh you know made a little program and worked uh worked over the off season uh making a run at road to pro we got our second race tomorrow uh and then uh, we brought you uh and michael seal along as well uh, mm -hmm. so you're working with chris carroll and spotting with them and um uh, and Michael Seals doing the same for me, and so that's really uh, exciting. And the kind of the idea is that uh, we're hoping that you guys are going to be making a, you know, uh, where I'm at next year, um, making a run at Road to Pro yourself. And uh, and you know, I mean, I, I the goal obviously is to make pro this year uh, at yeah. the end of uh, at end of this year. I know that's a really you got a long way to go. I got a couple more plateaus I need to hit before I feel like I'm actually ready for that. But you know, I hit a couple plateaus this last year, so maybe I could do it again this year. Well, I, I know right now, uh, I think you and Chris, and from what I've seen of Parker so far, I think you guys definitely have the skill to qualify to get past Road to Pro this year. It's just, uh, will luck be in our favor? Will we be able to stay out of those wrecks that, you know, sometimes collect you? I think that's the only thing that's going to hold you two back. Because uh, just to get a, an idea of how fast some of these guys are in beast racing, I usually run top half of top split. And I was even just today running Martinsville with those guys, and they were putting two and three tenths on me on hot laps and i was like what in the world is going on here <laughs> well these splits are pretty intense you know for yeah. instance like parker has a 6k i rating and he was the back half of the second split i'm i'm 55 i rating and i was in the back i was at the very back of the third split so i mean you're around you know the best of the best here and it's a lot of egos uh there's gonna be there's a lot of wrecks it's a pretty intense racing and yeah. uh, but it also gives you an opportunity it's points racing you know it's a it's a 13 week season with one drop and top 20 points go pro and so uh, you're also points racing at the same time and kind of consistently finish right around 10th all year you'd actually be in pretty good shape so that's you know staying out of those wrecks keeping the car clean doing the strategy right yeah well i think you guys got the talent to do it this year it's going to be really exciting by the way guys eventually chris carroll the, the driver that i'm spotting for in beast racing we will be uh streaming his races live which will be a lot of fun but uh, how soon that will be, I'm not sure yet. We're still pre prepping him up for that. But uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. And I told Lou I want a spot for him when he starts doing NAS as well. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So, okay, let's get into some fun stuff here, Nate. Let's just let's just relax and have some fun here. Let's talk about fantasy NASCAR. All right, yeah, you're in charge of the fantasy NASCAR in uh, the A51 league, and that's the league that I am in for fantasy NASCAR. Uh, do you have any hot tips? For people who play fantasy NASCAR, or maybe how to improve their scores from a week to week basis. Well, I haven't been doing so great this year. Uh, <laughs> so the number one thing would be, uh, you know, unfortunately I haven't been, I haven't had the time, you know, to like move drivers in and out of my garage during the races, yeah, and stuff like that. So you gotta, you also, you know, you have to put a little bit of time into it before the race starts, and you know, not pick people off the top of your head and during the race, you know, you know, move people in out of your garage and all that kind of stuff. But in general, you know, I would say if you're in a league that has a limited number of picks, like you're doing the NASCAR.com to only pick somebody, you know, 10 times in the regular season, right. you know, just kind of play the, play the people who are hot right now, yeah. you know, like, like don't, don't pick Harvick right now because you know that he, that team could run top three every week right now they're not doing that so save your picks for later yep. uh whereas kyle bush you know he's hitting on all the cyl cylinders you're going to probably maximize your kyle bush points if you just throw them in your lineup now um so you know that's probably the main thing is play the you know eric, the eric almarola's you know use up your picks with him but like maybe save harvick and truex you know but use use the penske guys you know they're the, they're fast now okay so i'm going to ask you for a little bit of a secret here but this is what people tune into the podcast for to get the secrets here. 
who right now would you say is a really good dark horse pick to put in there that you've kind of leaned on that you'd thought going into the year you wouldn't be using him that much? Who's kind of your uh, dark horse driver that you've been leaning on? Yeah, Eric Almirola has been really good, yeah. uh, but I don't know if he counts as a dark horse. Um, if I'm looking, you know, I think probably the best answer to that question might be Paul Bernard. Uh, not that he's, he's had a, like, I, I don't think he's been a great dark horse, but I think he will. He's not putting together races, but he's, been doing a good job finishing up front. Ryan Newman, um, if you're playing a league where it's like a salary base kind of, like a salary cap mm-hmm. kind of thing, he's, I'm sure, paying off really well, um, really bringing a bad card to some good finishes. And, uh, you know, Jimmy Johnson seemed to be the real deal last week, and he's actually pretty good at Bristol. So uh, I'd be putting Jimmy Johnson in there, you know, or thinking about Johnson for next week. And, you know, Kyle Larson is probably the opposite of that. I think he's probably... Yeah. not gotten you what you thought you would get out of him this year um though he's very very good at bristol so if you know if you've been smart you have not been playing kyle larson because you're waiting for him to heat up before you're using those picks but yep. Bris- bristol might be a good time to throw him in there yeah run that high line no almarola definitely counts i was thinking of anybody that was outside like the big six or seven you know like the keselowskis and harvicks and bushes and yeah. um i don't know would you consider uh Turex a, a big dog anymore he hasn't been running well this year you know, he's been running okay, um, but I think a lot of people are always suspicious of that team. That, you know, like Truex, if you give Truex a mediocre car, he doesn't seem to be able to finish very well. Um, yeah. Unlike a, a Harvick or a Kyle Busch who can kind of wheel the thing, you know, or or Kurt Busch and, and Kyle Larson. You know, you know, it seems like Truex is as good as his car. Um, and uh, so when they're not firing all cil- cylinders, uh, they're not going to finish on, uh, up front. At the same time, they're, they're getting decent finishes, and he is kind of uh, points racing, so you probably aren't killing yeah. yourself. But I'd, I'd wait. I'd wait on Truex. Yeah, I think that's good advice. One guy that I've been leaning on that I totally didn't expect to be this year um, has been Kurt Busch. He yeah. has been consistent this year, and he's been a big part of my team, that's for sure. Kurt's been amazing this year yeah. and really making Kyle Larson look bad that he's uh, outrunning Kyle in every every race on the same equipment. But I also yeah. think this new package is, does not play to Kyle Larson's strength, strengths at all. You, you would think, though, with kind of like the momentum in the dirt track history. But, yeah, you're right. It doesn't seem to, does it? Yeah, you're not, you're not kicking these things sideways. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Another guy um, that has been, and, and I think uh, Yost brings him up in the chat here, was Ryan Blaney, I've been using him almost every single week, and every week he's been up there. Now, um, he kind of had some issues at the end of the last race, but he's been excellent this year. Yeah, he's been, I mean, the Penske cars are the fastest cars this year by a mile, and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, unlike Keselowski and Logano, though, that team has a hard time putting together a whole race, Um, but definitely if, you know, in a salary cap kind of situation, you know, he's a good pick. Yeah, excellent. All right, so staying in the fun stuff and then we'll give some people some hot tips how to get faster but staying in the fun stuff i understand you have a little bit of an obsession with uh, guy fieri right did i say that right yeah <laughs> tell me he's, tell- he's got like this italian pronunciation that he'll do on the show but uh it's you can, you can call him anything you want i'm sure anything but late for dinner <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so how did this start uh, i remember you and i we had a conversation about him for like an hour and i was like Nathan really likes this guy, no pun intended. How how did that start? Uh, Yeah, fear. I mean, I guess it's kind of like, you know, I like Anthony Bourdain, uh, RIP, uh, and I like his show. And at the same time, like, there was a moment where Bourdain was, like, ripping on Guy Fieri. And so, you know, all I saw was this guy that kind of looked like the Smash Mouth singer. I'd never watched his show, so I flipped (laughs) on his show. And I loved it. I loved his show. And as much as I like Bourdain... I thought he was dead wrong on Fieri. Yeah. Um, like, you know, I was just really tired of a lot of that competitive food food stuff. Or, guy, you know, Bourdain seemed to, like he's traveling the world complaining about it and sad about it. And whereas Guy Fieri just, like, sees a chicken sandwich and he's like, yeah, that's a chicken sandwich. I love chicken. And then that's it. <laughs> and I, like, I'm like, yeah. that's my relationship with food, too. I see, like, a chili dog and I get really excited. Then I eat it and then I go, that was good. Uh, and like that's that's Fieri's attitude, and I love it. Uh, yeah. And uh, and he goes around. He seems uh, to treat people really well, and he has a really good attitude. And he was feeding people out here during the big fires, uh, oh, California. And he's from out here, and just seems like a really good dude. And I love his attitude. And you know, that's 
yeah, can I see some some good food? I'm like, yeah, that's uh, that's exciting. We don't have to like make a big deal about it. It's just good food. Well, the weird thing is too, it's become like a trend to hate on guy, and I've always wondered why, because unlike you know like Nickelback, um, he's never had a bad attitude. He's never gone around talk bad about people. He's he's just been a good dude, and for some reason lately, it's become like this cool thing to hate on guy guy, and I, I don't get it. I actually really like the guy as well. Even more so once you told me how much you liked him. I've kind of been watching his his show a little bit more now. So have you noticed that too? Yeah, maybe the cool thing is liking Guy Fieri then, and I'll still yeah. like him. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to be a contrarian here. I just like l- legit like the you know the food and the and the attitude and trying to you know be positive and excited because it's food. Like why shouldn't you be? <laughs> yeah, and he never he never fires back at people. So that's one thing that made me notice. It. It's when you brought him to my attention. I was like, you know what? A lot of people are hating on this guy. And he never responds or, or does anything mean back. So I got a lot of respect for him for that reason. So, all right, Nate. People want to know. And this is really hard because um, I know for me, I was better in the old A car than I am in the new gay car. Um, what, are the, what are the changes now that you need to know in the new A car to be fast in it? And I know in the A car, it was the old A car, it was really understanding throttle control and be able to drive off those rear tires but uh that's kind of changed now hasn't it um i think my approach would be the same um you know it's gonna be the same to drive in any car honestly you're gonna uh you get you have to have all the if you're only good at driving one kind of car then you're not a complete driver you need to learn how to practice and you need to learn how to get better and that's gonna apply to any car that you get in yeah Uh, so i wouldn't i wouldn't worry too much about uh, the different packages and all of that. Like one guy can still be faster than the other guy, and and you need to figure out how to do that. So you know, take take the time to practice, run a lot of laps, no matter what the package is. You know, if you're starting out and you've never been to a track before, that you haven't been to that car track combination, just go out there and run a ton of laps. Mm-hmm. Uh, do a lot of practice. You know, turn that delta on so you can see when and when you're gaining time versus losing time. Uh, and you know, watch the streamers. There's a ton of streamers even more in the last year than ever before. There's like peak guys streaming and you can see their throttle inputs, their brake inputs, emulate that, you know, yep. study that. Uh, and you're going to get faster and it doesn't matter um, what what the package is or what the car is. Okay. I hope you guys are hearing that um, because a lot of people think there's just this magic switch or a magic password or something that you can wave around and do and it's just going to make you fast. But if you keep hearing these podcasts over and over again, um, these fast guys are saying, practice, practice, practice. Watch the fast guys and emulate what they're doing. Um, Nate's, he didn't give some special uh, way to drive the car. He's telling you, practice, practice, and watch the fast guys. Yeah, I mean, at, so last year I did the NIS schedule, and I would say half of the weeks I had to go to a track I'd never been to before. Uh, and then by the time like my I rating was up, then I'm also going to go to you know top split, NIS, at Indianapolis, had never turned a lap there before in any car, and then I was doing that week after week, so I got really good right. at kind of just learning a track, figuring out, you know, within a couple of days, you know, how to get myself up to speed, uh, and involve, you know, watching the streamers, for sure. Like, right now, I watch a lot of Adam de Blasio streams. Mm-hmm. He's super fast, super smooth, uh, and uh, I think his streams are invaluable, um, and, you know, he's that, he's that cut ahead of me. So I always want to watch somebody that's a little faster than me. Yeah. Not so much faster than me that I can't figure out what they're doing, but the, you know they're just one step faster than me. Yeah. Um, and you know, and then just turn a bunch of laps. I would run, you know, at least two full fuel runs. Run that fuel tank dry on the same set of tires uh, before I even felt like I could. You know, if you can't run the the fuel cell dry without hitting the wall or spinning out, then you're not ready to run a race. So make sure you're there. Yes. Uh, and then another thing I would do, if you're turning that many laps, it's boring. Like I'll admit, practicing is really boring. So to make it fun, uh, what I usually do is I go out there, you know, when I'm going to run the fuel cell dry, is uh, I'll put a podcast on the headphones, some music, a comedy album, whatever, this podcast. Full uh, scenario and- podcast, that's right. <laughs> exactly. I only will put on Randy's uh, iRacing podcast. We'll send. The only it'll make you faster, guaranteed. Uh, and uh, and and I'll turn iRacing almost all the way down. So I'm basically driving the car on mute and listening to this podcast. And then what that does is, uh, you know, first um, it makes it more fun because you're listening to something uh, and you're going to be more likely to practice more if it's fun. Second, you learn how to drive the car without any sound. 
So, mm -hmm. and then you also learn how to drive the car with only half your brain because half your brain is paying attention to the thing you're listening to. So then when you get back in the car and turn the volume up and don't have a podcast on, it's, it's like, it's like the batter's box when the guy has that weight on his bat and then he pulls the weight off his bat. And now it feels really light. You'd be yeah. surprised how easy it is to drive even the A car, the old A car, uh, after, you know, with, with full volume and all your attention paid to it. So that, that would, that's kind of one way to like, kind of, um, speed up the process of getting to know a track i think yeah that's that's a really good idea i think i started doing that i think that helped me with streaming too because sometimes i get distracted by streaming so maybe maybe i'm always driving with just half a brain or maybe i'm just half brain who knows <laughs> <laughs> i could never do what you all do i see john or you or aaron reading chat and this and that i don't know how you guys do it i'm telling you it slows me down it, it definitely does but you know i have so much fun i could never stop doing it now you know <laughs> Well, this, is, this should be fun. This shouldn't be anything but fun. If you're not having fun doing this, then don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go and go pick some flowers or something. All right, Chad, I hope you're paying attention because we're about to do something that's a lot of fun. And uh, right now we got March Madness going on. My Michigan State Spartans are still in it. Oh, yeah, go green. And the Davises, Auburn, they're still in it, right? What do they say? War Eagle, is that what they say over there? And uh, Davis and I were talking about today, wouldn't that be awesome if they could play each other in the finals? We'll see. But since we have that going on, uh, Nathan is obviously a fan of NASCAR. And I thought we would do a um, kind of a 16-man bracket of the most, um, not necessarily best driver, but the most impactful driver in NASCAR history. Not only So it's going to take into effect his entire career, not only his wins and uh, his championships, but... Uh, Maybe even his persona and his interview skills and, and the things he did on the track and how much influence he actually had on NASCAR. So we actually have 13 drivers on here. These have been pre-selected by another list that I was looking at. And I wanted to give one wild card f for Nathan to add. I'm going to add a wild card and chat. You guys need to select a wild card driver to put on there as well. So um, Nathan, you, uh, I'll give you the list of drivers here. And then if there's a name on that's not on that list that you think needs to be on there, you let me know and we'll put them on. And while we're doing that chat, give me some names. Uh, go ahead and try to select a guy that we're going to put on here. Okay, Nathan. Here's the seeding right now for this list, okay? In the one seed, we've got Mr. Richard Petty. Mr. Over 200 wins himself. All right, that's a pretty good one. Number two. Uh, he shouldn't be on here because I forgot we changed the rule. This is the modern Aaron, by the way. Um, we've got David Pearson. I guess he raced in 89, so that still counts, right? He's got over 100 wins and uh, is, is regaled as many people as even better than Richard Petty himself. Um, I don't know if I'd agree with that, but... No, number three, we got Mr. Dale Earnhardt. He's number three on the list. Uh, number four is Jeff Gordon. Number five is Mr. Jimmy Johnson. Actually, on this list, it has Jimmy Johnson above Jeff Gordon. That's up for some debate, huh? Uh, after that, we've got Daryl Cartrip. <laughs> no, Daryl Waltrip. I mean, boy, I mean, you have to take his broadcast career into account too, right? I mean, if you're talking about most influential in the sport. Um, not only did he have a great racing career, 84 wins, three championships, but um, just think about the influence he's had in, in racing. I mean, I can't even have a live stream anymore without people yelling boogity, boogity, boogity into the chat. Uh, Tony Stewart is number six. Wow, he's above Mr. Texas Terry himself, Terry Labonte. Terry Labonte's in at number seven. Kevin Harvick is in at number eight. Kyle Busch, number nine. Rusty Wallace, ten. Here's a controversial one, Jack. Feel free to rage about this one. Joey Logano is number 11. Mark Martin, 12th. Kurt Busch. Number 13. All right. Now, is there any name that wasn't on the list that you would like to add, Mr. Nathan? Hmm. Uh, Cole Trickle. Cole Trickle. Put him on the um, list. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw my favorite old school NASCAR driver on there, uh, Neil Bonnet. Neil Bonnet. What a choice. That reminds me. I just watched a great documentary. Uh, it was called The Worst Week in NASCAR History. It was like speed weeks at Daytona, and they lost four, four, four or five drivers, and Neil Bonnet was the last one they lost, and it was horribly sad. 
What an awesome guy he was. So we'll put Neil Bonnet on the list. That's a great one. Neil Bonnet. Nath, uh, uh, Nathan, Zimmy has a really cool story about Dale Earnhardt and Neil Bonnet. You'll have to ask him about it sometime. Yeah, I'd love to. You sometimes I run the thirty-one on my car, uh, and that's a uh, that's a uh, tribute to Neil Bonnet. The last races he competitive races he ran uh, when he was Dale Earnhardt's teammate there. Yeah, it's hard to believe. You know, it's funny he was in that horrible wreck and then came back and drove again, and turns out he'd be his last, which is terrible. Uh, let's see, who should I add to this list? Uh, Chad, can you guess who I'm going to add to this list? I've talked about him quite a bit uh, recently. Team Goodwrench, that's right. You know who I'm adding, guys. I gotta have Handsome Hair Gant on this list. Yeah, I know he didn't get a ton of wins, but uh, Hair Gant brought Hollywood into racing. He was a, a visually appeased, appealing guy, so he had that going for him. Um, he he really liked to run the high line, something that wasn't all that common back in the day. And uh, I mean that that paint scheme is legendary as well. So we gotta put Hair Gant on here, right? Handsome Harry, Harry Gant. And chat, you got to give us somebody. Throw some names out there. Tim Richmond. <laughs> Ooh, somebody in chat said Tim Richmond. Tim Richmond. Good... All right. Do we have anybody else, chat? We're going to close the polls here in 15 seconds. Rick Mast. Ooh, he got a poll at Indianapolis Speedway. I think that was his biggest achievement. Okay, Rick Mast is a 16 seed. That was Handsome Harry's teammate. Are we going to shut her down in 10 seconds? All right, we'll take Rick Mast in the 16 seed. He's going to get molly though. Okay, so here we go. The first round of the greatest, not just driver, but all-around person in NASCAR history is going to be Rick Mast versus Richard Petty. Who are you, who are you taking in that one, Nathan? All right, so the logic I'm going to make these decisions off of sounds like it's like kind of like Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily just driving skill, but taking into account their impact on the sport and culture and all that. So, yeah, yes. I, obviously, I, I love Rick Mass's Twitter, but I'm got to go with Richard Petty there. Oh, Rick Mass has a Twitter. I'll check that out. It's a was, great Twitter. Was it close? Was it was it close between Richard Petty and Rick Mass? A, a little bit. Yeah, we're going to go <laughs> Petty. Petty edges them at the line. Okay, we can say goodbye to Rick Mast. Bye, Rick. Sorry, Tron. In the second round, or in the second bracket here, we got uh, David Pearson versus Handsome Harry. Oh, I love Harry Gant as a kid watching him. I remember when he won those four races in a row. Uh, love that Skull Bandit car. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, I got to go with Pearson. Oh, man, that's that's it. Skull Bandit Racing. They're already out of this thing. David Pearson moves on. All right. Next matchup, we've got Dale Earnhardt taking on his teammate, Neil Bonnet. Did you did you do that on purpose? <laughs> no, funny how that worked out. But, uh, you know, uh, I actually grew up, my favorite driver was Dale Earnhardt. Had all the stuff in the room and all that stuff as a kid. Uh, and uh, actually, my first, first uh, cup race I ever got to go to, uh, I used to go to the Milwaukee Mile um, every year and watch the Bush cars and the trucks. Uh, but when I got old enough to drive, 16, I saved up a bunch of money and got Bristol Night Race tickets. And Whoa. my first, uh, and drove all the way down from Illinois down to Bristol, Tennessee. And uh, that was in 1999. And got to uh, sit in turn two and got to watch uh, Earnhardt spin Labonte out and get that win. Uh, and that was one of the Wait. happiest days. You know, that was amazing. That was my first cup race. And I couldn't have been, it was amazing. One of my, it was just a great memory. Hold like, the I phone here. Earnhardt. This wait, you were at the Rattle His Cage race? Oh yeah. Yep, I was sitting up there in turn two and uh, uh it was an <laughs> awesome race and you know, Dale hadn't won in a while. Dale didn't uh, hadn't won since the Daytona five hundred in the previous year. So it was about a year and a half since his last win. Uh and that was kind of his comeback too. You know, he was really quick after that and uh uh and man that that crop Bristol, I mean nineteen ninety nine, that place is packed, right? And I heard they booed Earnhardt too when he did that. Half the crowd was booing. Half the crowd was cheering. When you're driving out of the track or even the wow. next day on the highway, people had, you know, the three with the circle and the line through it. People were booing and yelling and screaming. I mean, it was just a, a party. It was amazing. That's crazy. That's that's what a first race. We I would love to talk about that more, but we got to keep going. So we got Dale Earnhardt moving on. Goodbye, Neil Bonnet. 
Oh man, this kind of seems lopsided now too. Now that we do it, but the next next matchup we've got Jeff Gordon and Kurt Busch. I got to go with Jeff Gordon, but yeah, really, I, I mean, Kurt, I was not a fan of him when he was younger, and he's kind of grown on us. Like I think a lot of people would agree with that, but yeah. Jeff Gordon, what what how competitive NASCAR was when Gordon did what he did yeah. uh, is absolutely incredible. Got to go with Gordon. Yeah, there's a there's a really good documentary that I just watched called Refuse to Lose, and it just showed their setup for Daytona. No wonder these guys were champions, man. It was awesome. Yeah. And Chris a, big part of, a big part of Earnhardt's legacy too is being the foil to Gordon, uh, just as Gordon being the foil to Earnhardt. So you yeah. can't you got to see them as a pair in some ways. Another great documentary about those two as well. What an awesome thing. I don't know if Aaron's listening, but this next one, ooh, here we go. This is a good one. We've got Daryl Waltrip going up against Mark Martin. Ooh, um, I'm very, my my personal favorite of the two is Mark Martin by a mile, but if we're asking, if I'm voting for Hall of Fame and I have to pick one, you know, who goes on the first ballot, I mean, Daryl Waltrip uh, is did an incredible i mean his his racing career his stats are incredible um and then obviously being a personality um and uh you know i know he's retiring soon but uh and a lot of people are kind of annoyed sometimes by his calls now but we can't <laughs> you know his his impact on the sport uh you know multiplied by his driving ability you know few people have been this impact impactful out, outside the track that are as good of a driver as he was you know he has both of them so you got to go with Daryl Waltrip. Nah, these cars are driving good. <laughs> That's such a great call. <laughs> All right. On to the next one. Ooh, here's a... Wow. They're kind of... See, we're getting to the towards the middle of the bracket. And the further we go into it, the closer they are. But we've got Tony Stewart taking on Joey Logano. He does have a great pod- podcast, Chris. Mark Martin does. Yeah, Mark Martin's podcast is great. And uh, if you love short track racing, I mean, he's... He's just in a great dude all around. He's got good Twitter, too. So, uh, Joey Logano versus who? Tony Stewart. Stewart. Got to go with Stewart. I mean, Logano's not the most likable dude. He's kind of a – I find him most mostly annoying, but he's got just incredible talent. And yeah. no, one, no one can – that's one of the worst things about modern NASCAR is so many of the guys with a lot of talent are kind of annoying, and you don't want to root for them. Yeah. Um, or just maybe it's just getting older, and it's hard to root for somebody my own age as opposed to being a kid and they're like kind of like dad figures or whatever. Um, but yeah, Tony Stewart is, uh, you know, what he's, what he's done, um, as an owner, as a track owner, uh, for dirt racing, just all around. I know this is a NASCAR pool. Um, but, uh, you know, he's, he's, it will see be kind of being seen as an end, end of an era, uh, yeah. and a little bit of a throwback and, uh, and he's, his stock has aged well. Uh, uh and so, yeah, yeah, I gotta go with Clint Stewart here. It's funny, Jaron brings up something, brings up a quote. He's gonna bust his butt. But if you remember at Auto Club, by the way, how weird we're talking about the Sons podcast. Remember that when Joe Logano ran him all the way down to the white line <laughs> at <laughs> Auto Club, and Tony Stewart was gonna bust his face. He said something else. <laughs> Joey Logano is one of the best all-around drivers on the track right now. He's better mm-hmm. than the fans give him credit for, even. Uh, and uh, but still gotta go with Tony. Yep. That was a good one, Jared. Thanks for reminding us of that. Uh, you think? Okay. That's another good question by Scott Yost. Okay, we got Terry LeBeau. Ooh, here's a great one. Man, these are getting better and better as these goes on. We've got Terry Labonte taking on Rusty Wallace. That's a really, really tough one. I'm going Texas Terry Labonte. Oh, good one. Um, I mean, Rusty, Rusty's amazing, and he was such a great rival to Dale Earnhardt before, you know, Jeff Gordon was the rival. And I remember them getting in fights at Bristol, those two black cars going back and forth, Pontiac versus Chevy, and uh, that was that was a lot of fun. But, I mean, Mark Martin for me is – I'm sorry, uh, Terry Labonte for me is, you know, just – so good at what he did of no matter what car you put him in after 500 miles, he somehow ended up in eighth place every single race. And, uh, I, I think he's, a, uh, I think that's really cool. And, um, you know, but Rusty's on MRN now, Terry Labonte's kind of disappeared from the racing scene and Rusty's, what you said. Been, uh, so actually, you know, I'm going to change my vote. I'm changing it to Rusty. Oh, um, we changed it. I'm changing it. I'm changing it. Uh, yes, I think broadcasting counts thing, too. Hall of Fame kind of vote. You got to go with Rusty. I'm going Rusty. He changed it to Rusty, and uh, uh, Chris was screaming Rusty in the chat here, and he says his interview on Dale Jr. Download is outstanding. Yeah, it's um, really good. 
Rusty also had a really cool moment thinking back to that worst week in NASCAR history when Neil Bonnet died when he stood up yeah. in that driver meeting and he set them all straight on how they're going to race for that race. And you could tell the dude was about to cry. It's like, man, he's got a lot of respect for that driver. It was, uh, it was really cool. So Rusty takes it over Terry. Man, it's just it's just weird to think about talking about like all-time driver's list, influential, and Texas Terry getting knocked off. But you're right. After his driving career was over, that's it. He disappeared. Good point. Here's one. Holy cow. This might be the best matchup of the night this far, and how ironic, because it's the 9 seed taking on the 8 seed. How about this one? Chat, you're going to love this. Kevin Harvick taking on Kyle Busch. You got to go Kyle Busch. Um, I don't think both each have, mm. They could both have one championship, but, you know, Kyle, I think Kyle's, you know, the best living race car driver, you know, that's, you know, or current racing, you know, driver, active race car driver. Um, I don't like Kyle. Um, yeah. Honestly, I don't like, I think Kevin's annoying off the track too. I find him, I think he's a whiner. He always blames everyone else. Uh, Kyle, you know, that move he pulled on uh, Ron Hornaday a long time ago when he wrecked him on purpose. Oh, I hated that. You know, head onto the wall like that. That, that could have ended his career right there. So, you know, I'm, I'm starting Kyle out at a big deficit. Um, but I think he's overcome that deficit. He's uh, really, you know, cleaned his act up and uh, he's still, he still can outdrive anyone. Um, you give, you put Harvick and Bush and in, uh, in mediocre cars. And I think Kyle, Kyle's going to beat him. Yeah, I agree. I think that's what I was saying the other day. You put Kyle in almost any car in NASCAR and he's probably going to win a race Win races in that car. It doesn't seem to matter. There've been races where he's called the car junk and still won. So, <laughs> but you know, long term. Long term, I think Harvick's going to have a great career in the broadcasting booth, and you know he might, he yeah. might turn, he might turn the tides. You know, after they they both uh, retire too. That's true. He's got that charisma. He he's got some good charisma. Jaron says Kyle for sure. Put Kyle in the forty three, and he will win. You know what? <laughs> that just might be true, Jaron. Yeah, it's hard to hard to win when your brakes fail every race. <laughs> oh, poor Bubba, poor Bubba. I think he's going to kill Bubba. <laughs> hey, let's talk about that. Okay, you brought up the, the Kyle Busch, Ron Hornady. And so, you know what's funny about that, too? Like, Ron really had nowhere to go. And Kyle gets all mad and just puts him in the wall. That's true for me, too. I hated him from that moment on. I hated him. So, if Kyle winds up getting far in this race it's, or in this list, it's not because Nathan wants him to get there. It's just because he's that dang good, you know? Exactly. All so. right, so now we are we in the lead eight now? We moved up. We've got eight drivers left on this list. We still got Richard Petty in the one seed, David Pearson in the two, Dale Earnhardt in the three, Jeff Gordon in the four, Daryl Waltrip in the five, Tony Stewart in the six, uh, Kyle Busch, nine seed, and Rusty Wallace, ten seed. So there is a little bit of parody here. It's, it's amazing. So here we go. We've got Rusty Wallace going up against Richard Petty. Well, we've kind of already talked about everyone, so I'll just give my pick. It's the king. The king. Yeah, you got to go with the king on that one. And Rusty's great. And the funny thing is, it's weird. Like, you know, Rusty's awesome. But uh, going up against the king, what are you going to do? All right. We've got David Pearson. Oh, man, this is going to be controversial, Nathan, I think, no matter which way you go. David Pearson taking on Kyle Busch. Boy, that's a that's a tough one. And I, I, I mean, David Pearson was probably one of the best drivers ever uh, of all time. And, um, you know, I think I'm going to go with Pearson. Uh, and, you know, honestly, you ask me this question 10 years from now, uh, that Kyle Busch has the talent where he could one day be considered better than David Pearson. Uh, not yet. Got to go with, uh, got to go with Pearson. So Pearson moves on. Jessica in the chat says, day a Kyle Busch. Kyle Busch can't race while smoking. <laughs> Good one, Spencer. <laughs> Did Pearson do that as well? I think, okay. See, Kyle I, Bush could win while vaping. I definitely can't disagree with your choice, Nathan. But I think a case could be made for Kyle Bush in this debate. Isn't that crazy to think that Kyle Bush could be debated about whether or not he's better than David Pearson? I mean, in all the series of NASCAR, he's got over 200 wins now, and they won't stop talking about that ad nauseum. But, uh, you know, and we've we've got a much bigger sample size of Kyle as well. I guess Pearson ran like... I think it was like 500 races where Richard Petty ran like a thousand and something. And we know Kyle Busch is going to run way more than those two even. So it's, it's crazy to think that uh, Kyle Busch one day might go down as one of the best ever. <laughs> yeah. So I weird. mean, 
Kyle Busch has a lot of numbers because he has a lot of starts. You know, obviously in the local series. Richard Petty has a lot of numbers because he had a lot of starts when he was better equipment than people he was around. And yeah. uh, when you, But when you put David Pearson and Richard Petty at the, on the track at the same time, it was a pretty even match. Uh, so I think that's all you have to say. So Kyle Busch is now off the list. All right, now. Dale Earnhardt. Man, this is a crazy list. Dale Earnhardt or Tony Stewart? Yeah, I mean, they're, uh, that's a, those are two very likable drivers. Got to go with Dale Earnhardt, though. Yeah. Kind of similar attitudes as well, you know? Yeah. All right. Oh, my gosh. I don't know how you're going to pick this next one. We've got Jeff Gordon taking on Daryl Waltrip. I'm going to go with Jeff Gordon, uh, and uh, I, I really do see him as a kind of defining a whole generation of drivers in a way that Daryl Waltrip maybe got overshadowed a little bit by Dale Earnhardt, fairly or unfairly. Uh, so it comes down to importance and Hall of Fame style. I'm going Jeff Gordon. You know what's funny? You know what got me into NASCAR? It was after that, uh, what really got me, I mean, I watched Race with my dad's before, but it was after that 1997 Daytona 500 win that Gordon got. I got a Jeff Gordon toy at Burger King, who sponsored Dale Earnhardt at the time, by the way. But I got a Jeff Gordon toy car at Burger King, and I love that little toy, and that's one of the things that got me to NASCAR, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah, that's, <laughs> but, and you know that rainbow-colored car, it's, it's very similar to a lot of kids with the M&M's car. Yeah. Uh, and just immediately they see it, they like it, and real shame that NASCAR doesn't have more uh, kind of iconic schemes like that now that they run you know 50 different paint schemes and now they're these wraps that are like really complicated uh, yep. schemes that don't really look good from tv and whereas that rainbow car is stuck out that black car is stuck out and uh you know i think that was a real big thing and you know us kids becoming fans and, and he that's was the same so cool also that dale earnhardt turned the car over hopped out of the ambulance and finished the, and got finished back the, the race car, yeah, the that race. was the same race what a race that was you guys want to go watch that documentary on that race it's so good it's called refuse to lose and the funny thing is, I wound up being an Earnhardt fan over Gordon, but Gordon was just so cool, and uh, he was so good for the sport at that time. I mean, right and shortly after is. his boom, I mean, it became one of the fastest-growing sports in the United States. Yeah, he still is. He's uh, yeah. and he's doing a great job in the, I think, so far too. Yeah, so he's been good. All right, we're down to the final four. What a list we have here! All right, we've got the number one seed Richard Petty, the winningest driver. We've got David Pierce in the two seed. It's the the top four seeds are the ones that made it to the final four. But actually, I had no doubt about these ones. And uh, hey, the weird thing is, we actually took Jimmy didn't make the list somehow. But I think he would have lost somewhere along the way. I don't know. Dang. We'll have to do. Okay, we'll put Jimmy up against the winner. How about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Richard Petty is now taking on Jeff Gordon. It's not just stats here, but who's been bigger for the sport? Who's been? You gotta go. Richard Petty's the king. You know, they call him the king oh. for the reason. Gotta go Richard Petty. Jeff Gordon has been eliminated. Chat, what do you think about that? Who are you taking? Are you taking Jeff Gordon or Richard Petty as one of the most influential drivers of all time? I mean, I mean, stats count. All that stuff counts. Man, that's a... I think it would have gone the same way, though. Here we go. Second game. Not game, but matchup. David Pearson and Big, 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 Big E going at it. I'm going Dale Earnhardt. I think if they're on the track together, those those would have been some amazing races uh, as far as like general importance for the sport, all of that, going Dale Earnhardt. Wow. So the final two most deserving drivers to be in the Hall of Fame, I guess, is really the criteria. We have Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt. Jessica says, Cal Bush. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Petty I'm going- Dale Earnhardt. I'm going to go Dale Earnhardt on this one. Um, yes. I'm biased. I was a fan, um, but I think he, you know, Richard Petty's the king of the of the NASCAR of old, and Dale Earnhardt's the king of contempt modern NASCAR and really brought it and made, Na- you know, really helped make NASCAR what it is and, you know, or at least what it was, you know, like yeah. built it up. And obviously since he's gone, you know, the, it's a testament to what he did, that how things have gone downhill since he uh, left us. And, uh, and I think, you know that, but that legacy is still there with Dale Jr. Mm-hmm. Everything he's Dale uh, Jr. has done, and you know he's just been great in the booth. But also like uh, Junior Motorsports and how many of the drivers that are uh, up and coming 
have been recruited through that system. Uh, that Earnhardt name is still there, and it's still a big part of NASCAR. Um, I'm sorry, that black three is uh, probably the most iconic uh, number, an important number, and you know, not just NASCAR, but probably any motorsport. Yeah. You know, you'd, I don't think if you got out here with like an F1 fan, an IndyCar fan, you know, all the dirt tr- racers, and you know, I don't think people would say Richard Petty was a skill level of like a Senna. Whereas, like a Dale Earnhardt and Senna conversation is one you could have. You know, yeah. I really do. I put him at the top um, of all motorsport. Uh, you know, he'd be in that conversation with like a Senna or somebody like that. That yeah. I don't think I would do for Richard. So I'm going uh, cultural importance. Everything going Dale Earnhardt. Well, I mean, still to this day, at least in Michigan, if you go to a Michigan race, you still see three flags all over the place. The guy is still being felt here and today, and as important as Richard Petty was. How many old Richard Petty flags you've seen flown when you go to a race? Zero. Yeah, exactly. You know, maybe it's because Bo Wallace is driving the car now, and I like Bo Wallace, but they're not doing so hot. And and uh, yeah, just talk about how good Dale was. I mean, it wasn't just a NASCAR that he was winning. Remember, he was winning all the Iraq races in those Iraq cars. He won um, a Le Mans race in a mud vet. Um, he won a and a twenty four at Daytona. Yeah, I mean the guy was just good, and, and and I mean even in NASCAR he was good on the road courses. He was good everywhere, and yeah, he probably had really good equipment. But I don't think I've ever seen anyone no. do that well in in children's I don't stuff. Think, I don't think RCR ever had the best equipment, and uh, you know even even on the yeah. Mark Martin podcast he was like he's like. You know, because him and you know Earnhardt would mess with Mark when he was a uh, rookie, and you know Mark was saying, yeah, you know, the biggest, the thing that made him most mad about Earnhardt was getting beat by a guy in a slower car, and that's what Earnhardt <laughs> was able to do was yeah. to beat people in a slower car, and you know we don't really have too many equivalents to that. I would say Kyle Larson probably uh, beats people in in slower cars, but there you know there are not too many. Uh, uh, drivers today and honestly I think Dale Earnhardt would have been great in modern NASCAR too you know with oh, kind yeah. of more based on restarts and short runs and stuff like that I mean uh, he he was the best at that in his era and I think that would have played into his strengths so there you have it folks uh, a driver from California no less well I guess you grew up in the Midwest but now lives in California choosing Dale Earnhardt as the most influential driver the most deserving of the hall of fame and i can't disagree with that and this is something i'm gonna do with mark too we'll do another bracket with mark and i'd love to see where he goes on this i don't see uh, i wonder who he would put on there but uh man that was a lot of fun you choose dale earnhardt does jimmy johnson unthrone dale earnhardt from that seat no no um you know where you put jimmy is interesting i think you i put him before behind richard and <laughs> Uh, Dale uh, of the but you know he won seven championships I, I it'd be hard for me to pick Jeff versus Jimmy that's a really tough I'm not sure I'd know how to make that this decision because I do think Jimmy um, you know had a run in a different era of NASCAR I don't think it I don't think a championship means as much now as it used to um, I think you know before it really did mean the best driver and now it's yeah. you know something you know, there's a lot more luck and chance and equipment you know, built into the system. It's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, you're still, everyone is still going against each other and you're still beating the best of the best. But, uh, uh, and Jimmy, what Jimmy accomplished is great. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't, I don't consider it in the same league. Here's a question for you too, Nathan. Do you think the way Dale went, um, do you think it makes him even more, of an icon in racing, do you think that helped his his, his brand at all, or, or what do you think? Oh, certainly. I mean, you yeah. you know that's it's you know you're not, you're not a person anymore. You're literally not a person anymore. That's uh, true. And and for somebody like that, it becomes a little bit transcendent, and you know people see him you know almost in a religious sense because of that. And uh, you know same way like you know Kurt Cobain or somebody yeah. John Lennon, um, and you know he's but what Dale would have accomplished uh, in his life. Uh, you know, had he kept going, um, you know, not just on the track, but off the track and what that could have been would, you know, I think there's a big hole, there's a hole in the sport and there's a a hole in culture uh, left by his passing. And uh, I I think he would have been uh, even greater alive. Yeah, exactly. And, And the crazy thing is too, unlike, you know, like Richard Petty, who was absolutely horrible when I started watching racing, we never saw a huge fall off from Dale. We started to see a little bit of a one, and then you remember he had that comeback just like you talked about, but then we started to see a little bit again. But we never saw a huge uh, fall-off with Dale. We never saw a decline in him, really, a, a big one. 
ninety seven so. to ninety eight were rough years. You know, that's yeah. that same race we were talking about, Neil Bonnet's bad crash at Talladega in ninety six. Mm-hmm. Um or sorry, that was Dale Earnhardt's bad crash. No, the Neil Bonnet one, that was ninety three or four. But uh the Dale Earnhardt's bad crash in ninety six uh at Talladega when uh he got hit while he was upside down and he was uh, uh he was he wasn't really right after that for a little while. He was, you know, running for the championship in ninety six before that wreck uh yep. and fell off pretty bad. And then ninety seven was never won. It was the only year he didn't win a race. He had that blackout. Um, uh, it was at Darlington. Um, and then uh, 98, like even though he got his Daytona 500, so people won't remember it, but it, he was even worse in 98 than he was in 97. Just was, you know, 20th place at best all year. Uh, and it really wasn't until 99 that he just like something the flip switch. Uh, so you have to think that there was a, there was a lingering injury there uh, those years. And then he was, fat, you know, won races in 99 and 2000 finished second in the points to Bobby Labonte in 2000. So he was back. He could have could have made a run at an eighth championship. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that have been something? Jessica says, sorry for setting our house on fire during the stream. <laughs> oh, well, you're glad forgiven. you didn't burn down. Yeah. All right, guys. We, got, we just got a little bit of time left. This is a time where you can ask Nathan some questions. Maybe you have some questions about getting faster in iRacing, or maybe you want to know more about Nathan himself. Um, we already had some questions already, and we'll go through those. And if you have any questions, just put them in the chat, and we'll get to them. Hydra wants to know, on a scale of 1 through 10, how good are you at ra- at iRacing? Now, Hydra's never got to see you race, unfortunately, but uh, he's going to be modest about it. But go ahead and answer that, Nathan. Um, I mean, oh, I'd give myself like maybe a 6 or a 7. Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, there's no matter what race you're in, there's guys that are faster than you and uh, and there's guys that are faster than them so you know it depends on like where you're racing it's a uh, you know i'm a kind of a 5k i rating driver and i can run with 5k people but when i'm around the 6k people who those are the guys that really have a chance at making it into pro uh and then then if you can do that then you get into pro well suddenly you're in the back half of the field there and you got a second plateau uh and then if you can make that then maybe you can make peak well, now you're running the back at peak and you've got another plateau to make. So, you know, to me, there's, uh, I've got at least three, four plateaus ahead of me, uh, you know, where I really increase my skills. So like, it's hard to say, it's hard to give myself, you know, anything higher than maybe like a six or so. Cause I got so a long way to go. Yeah. If I were to rate Nate and I think I could maybe do it a little bit more objectively than him, I would say a bare minimum. He's an eight. Um, he's so close to being top deer. It's insane. I mean, he's right on the verge. So I, I, Hedra, if you're hearing me and you ever get a chance to watch Nathan race through either John's stream or my stream or uh, anything else, do it because the dude is fast and he's super modest. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to read Spencer's question. Uh, Yost wanted to know, if the super late model was fixed, would you run it in the official races? Yeah, I mean, now that I'm like figuring out open setups a little bit and have other people to share setups with, yeah, I would, I'd do that. You know, I, I didn't I didn't run the supers before just because they were broken, and also just I stayed away from the open stuff until I could, you know, take the time. And you know, the thing about open setups is that, you know, you're sometimes you're going to get beat by somebody that has a faster car than you. Right. And before, like, yeah, somebody with like Lou would hand me a, a, a you know fast setup there, you know, through A51. But if someone's going to beat me, I wanted to make sure I knew how to beat them. You know, did they just make a change on that setup that made them faster? So it wasn't until I was confident being able to make changes on the setup uh so that i know that i got beat by you know i got beat right like i got beat at a thing that i'm trying to do and uh so now that now that i'm doing open though I'll, I'll be uh really excited to run the super late so i think th- those look like a blast i haven't had a chance to do it a whole lot but that that might be my favorite new car on the server for me well they're gonna they they're gonna run most like the old a car because you can easily put too much uh, throttle in those things and get them around. So well, those things they definitely drive different than the A car on the short tracks. I mean, you yeah. you actually go quicker in super. They can they can just hug around the corner yeah. uh, incredibly. It's a, it's amazing how fast that those things are. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's going to be the the funnest and the hardest one to hang on to. I think now that the old A car is gone. And so uh, Scott Yost wants to know Bob Seneca or Mike Eddy. I have no idea who those guys are. <laughs> Uh, no opinion. <laughs> Who are they? Well, Seneca is uh, definitely a short, like an old uh, short track guy. Like my my brain's going to the uh, ASA, the American Speed Association series. Uh, Bob Eddy, I'm not exactly sure. I feel like I've heard the name, but I'm more. I know I know Seneca is an old short track guy. Okay, okay. So Scott probably wanted them to be on the all time most influential drivers list. 
Okay. You know, and uh, my hometown, Rockford, Illinois, we uh, they hosted the Short Track National Championships and got to see a lot of people uh, as a kid. Uh, Mark Martin actually won that race one year, but I'd see, you know, Dick Trickle would run every year. Saw um, uh, Matt Kenseth and actually Chad Knauss is from my uh, hometown. And I remember watching him drive late models at that track. Yeah, that's that's a good question there. <laughs> Here's one from Spencer. He says, will you ever wreck John Theodore? <laughs> well, I sure hope not. Um, statistically, if we're around each other enough at some point, well, you know, an accident could happen. But, uh, uh, you know, John John is a really um, respectful driver, and uh, I am I am too. Uh, I think sometimes I am to a uh, I'm really, you know, I don't lay bumpers on people. I don't, you know, crowd them or door them. And sometimes you got to do that. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm not – I've never intentionally wrecked somebody, and uh, – uh, you know, only a few people have been, you know, one time I did put a bumper to somebody on purpose. It was one time and I regretted it, uh, and tried to do a bump and run and ended up spinning the person out. I take that back in a league race and I felt really bad and I'll probably not do that ever again. You were so like me, Nathan, in that sense. And actually, Nathan, that's one thing I'm trying to get better at doing this year is putting the bumper to somebody without wrecking them. So it's a skill to learn. Yeah, it's a skill to learn. I never, I never bothered to learn it. And I was in a race situation. It was like three to go at Marshall on the D car, uh, in a league race. And I was way faster than a leader running second, third place is knocking my bumper off. And he was just parking the bus in the middle of the corner. And I, so there was really no other way to get around him than to, you know, kind of try to tap him up the hill. Uh, but I'd never practiced it and I'd never done it. And I just did it wrong. I ended up, uh, uh turning him sideways and, uh, cost them both of us a good finish. So I really regretted that. So don't do it unless you know how to do it. Let's say, okay, let's say you're in a road to pro race. It's got three to go. You're on a restart. John Theodore is right in front of you. Three to go. It's at Martinsville. You know how hard it is to pass at Martinsville, but you're faster than him. Are you gonna? Are you? Would you wreck him to get the win? To get the win, I mean, I'm points racing road to pro, so you know, finishing first or second isn't the biggest deal. Though at the in when you went through, you know, intellect, like you know that from like you know theoretically, like you know that, but while you're driving, you want to get that win. And yeah, um, if if he was holding me up and he wasn't giving me any other way to get around him, uh, it's at Martinsville, it's for the win. Yeah, I would try to push him up the hill a little bit. I would I would err on the side of not getting the pass done and keeping him going straight then you know hit him and just hope it works out. i would not do that um yeah i would i mean he would do the same to me if i'm holding him up and he's running yeah. second and it's martinsville um and you've practiced it and knew how to do it i would do it um would i do that at a mile and a half track no i would not be confident that i could hit him in a way that wouldn't spin him out so yeah uh, and also yeah. you have other ways of passing people um so yeah but if i you know if he's if and it's only in that one very specific situation would i ever think of yeah. doing that you're right that'd be you know a lot of people have been asking me in this league if i'd dump aaron to do it and i said right over the the voice chat i said if it came down to it uh yeah i would do it now and well i would just wreck aaron for the fun of it who cares <laughs> no i'm kidding but kidding aaron i i would to- yeah i would do it and i would expect aaron to do the same to me i told all those guys i'd wreck any one of you for winning this league that's how bad i wanted it <laughs> but uh yeah, he said if the circumstance was right, he'd put the bumper to him. Calvin wants to know, ooh, this is a great question for you, Nathan, VR or screen? So I'm, I'm pretty funny in that I've never I raced on a screen. Um, I've only I raced on VR. I've never done a, turned a single lap on a screen. So I got I got I racing right, you know, because I saw the Oculus set was cheap and I pulled the trigger on, you know, getting that and a, and a wheel and a computer basically because I really wanted, you know, just seem like a – doing racing in, a, in VR seemed like really fun. It just wasn't appealing enough to me to even do it on the screen. The VR was really the big selling point. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I've, o- I've only ever turned laps in VR, which in some way might be an advantage. I think some people had to learn VR where I'm a VR native. Yeah. So uh, I've, uh, I use the Rift. Um, it has, uh, you know, Facebook makes it. They have a ton of money invested in that. They have a lot of customer support. It's like, a, I think, the simplest VR set to use right it doesn't have all the features that some of the other ones have but as far as being something you don't have to think about um you have to worry about and change tons of settings it works right out of the box and so i use that and um and they've got a new one coming out that's basically the same thing um tiny tiny upgrade uh called the rift s and i think that's coming out you know in a month or two you're gonna be getting that 
Yeah, I'll get that. It'll be nice to have kind of new components. You know, the thing I have, you know, I've been, I've used the thing a ton over the last year and a half. Well, if you're looking to sell your old one, talk to this guy. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, it might be. I, the, seems like the secondary market on them is still pretty strong. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Well, guys, I think we're going to end it there. I just, man, Nathan's just a, a really fun guy to talk to. And we had a lot of fun tonight. I, I want to thank you for coming out. Hey, if you want to support Nathan, check out uh, Beast Racing's website here. Uh, and uh, check out the team there. Uh, check him out whenever he runs the podium stuff. I don't know if you're doing podium much anymore with the with the road to pro going now. But uh, just yeah, make I might sure. get into it. I might get into it. I might run all that stuff next year. I kind of missed the just kind of missed it. You know, I was I spent the off season working on open setup stuff so much. I just missed all the signups and everything. Yeah, yeah. So I think we run a little bit more of that next year too. So um, if you ever see me spotting for Nate on the stream, which may happen, may or may not, I don't know. Uh, check that out and uh, just any chance you get he's a great guy for the community and any chance you get to show him love please do it so so nathan thanks for coming on and uh you got any you got any last words for us yeah i mean i, I just want to shout out yeah yeah john theodore channel i do a john and i think he's a really good dude and has the right attitude how you should yeah. approach other people mm -hmm. uh on the racetrack obviously aaron Rodgers. you know he's that's how i learned to drive the the cars watching his stream and uh super informative and th then uh, aaron made that discord and there's just tons of great people like lou uh uh on that discord and then mm -hmm. then you randy i mean it's been awesome uh you know from the first time i don't know when the first race we had together but it's pretty clear like immediately that uh you had the right attitude and you know wanting to learn um but also treating people right and i don't i don't think there's a, a nicer guy uh on the sim than you and it's uh been really cool to watch you start streaming and now uh, the stream looks awesome it's the best looking stream uh i've seen on iRacing and oh, that's cool just i mean uh just uh you know really cool that you're doing this and that you let me come on and and blabber oh well, it's been fun and Thanks for that. I know it looks better with the, with some beast claws on it now, doesn't it? it looks pretty good. <laughs> Man, we're super excited to have you on board. Yeah, that's good. that's awesome. Well, thanks guys, and again, check out that website I posted in that link there. I thank everyone for watching, and then if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Helps us out a ton, and we're gonna close it up here. We'll catch you guys in the next one. See ya. Bye.